Good morning and welcome to this, the third and final session in a series of events designed to focus attention on the continental European market. We at the uh, IIEA uh, are partnering with Enterprise Ireland to bring this series of events to you. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers today, uh, a few standalone speakers and a panel of business people who are involved in pan-European business. And we hope that their insights will help you, uh, businesses interested in accessing the European market or deepening your relationship with uh, uh, players in, the, in that market. Uh, so looking forward to a, a long and productive discussion over the next 90 minutes on a whole range of issues uh, on, the, on the related topic. So to kick off, and quite appropriately, we have the head of Enterprise Ireland, a partner in this series of events, uh, Leo Clancy, who will give an overview of uh, issues and topics around uh, Ireland's relationship and Irish businesses' relationship with, with continental Europe in the context, inevitably, of the shift that's occurred following the, Britain's departure from the European Union. So with that, uh, Leo, if I could hand over to you to take the floor and uh, get proceedings underway. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And good morning to members of the Irish business community, members of the IAEA and our guest speakers. It's a real pleasure and privilege to have the opportunity to open this event today, the third and final webinar in this Europe is Our Future series, which we are running jointly, of course, with the Institute of International and European Affairs. The title of the series highlights Enterprise Ireland's strategy to put a strong focus on the EU markets. These markets will play a pivotal role in Ireland's future, and they will change our trade landscape. As the government's trade and technology agency, Enterprise Ireland is absolutely committed to increasing the capability and impact of Irish enterprise generally. The Enterprise Ireland team of 850 professionals works with over 5,000 Irish businesses who employ 220,000 people here. Our team in 10 offices across Ireland works hand in hand with these Irish businesses, providing them with the support to develop their capability so that they can grow successfully over time. Our supports are focused on areas like innovation, operational competence, skills and finance. And as we have a small domestic market in Ireland and as business owners will know, most Irish companies must export to succeed and scale. Our 40 overseas offices work hand in hand with these same Irish businesses, helping them to enter and scale in overseas markets in order to deliver export growth. At the end of 2020, these exports were valued at over 25 billion euros, the result of a decade of very strong growth by Enterprise Ireland backed companies. Customers in more than 60 countries across five continents are buying 60% more Irish products and services than they did 10 years ago, a huge growth. However, we are ambitious when we realize that more growth equates to more jobs and increased prosperity in Ireland and in the markets we serve, which I'll come back to in due course. Our ambition for 2021 is to support the delivery of an export-led recovery, returning export growth to pre-pandemic levels in the years ahead and leveraging what is a very strong global recovery. The title of today's webinar, Embedding Your Business in the EU, speaks to this ambition. While the US and the UK markets remain incredibly important for Irish businesses, there's a really strong case and a compelling case to be made for increasing our focus on the Eurozone. The Eurozone markets, by which I mean those markets who've adopted the Euro, are a cornerstone of Enterprise Ireland's strategy. We launched a Eurozone strategy in 2017, and since then, exports to the Eurozone have increased by 33%. And growth in Enterprise Ireland client exports have increased by 15% in 2019 alone. This export success is testament to the innovative products and services of Irish enterprise and the strong and growing relationships they have in Europe. However, we're not finished. Our exports to the Eurozone at 5.85 billion euros equal less than 80% of our exports to the UK. Now, the UK is a very long standing and close and the closest market that Ireland has, but the Eurozone is five times the size of the UK in terms of population and GDP, and it's a huge opportunity. The size of that un untapped opportunity is enormous, and now in a time of change and disruption, we can strengthen our relationships and integrate and embed our businesses and our solutions within the EU. 
a recent trade mission led by the Thanischstadt Paris and Berlin was the first in-person trade mission in 18 months. And that these were the first markets is an indication of the importance we attribute to these and all Eurozone markets. The benefits of the European Union are very clear. The single market was designed to be just that, a large market of countries in close proximity to each other that facilitates frictionless trade without visible barriers like tariffs and customs procedures, but also without less visible barriers like different regulatory requirements. The single currency, which is going to be a topic of discussion with the panel later on this morning, makes the Eurozone a particularly attractive proposition for SMEs, reducing complexity and risk that might come with currency volatility, having to manage your business in various currencies and other aspects. So that is a huge opportunity in and of itself. And we are in a time of disruption. That disruption brings challenges, but it also brings opportunities. And I'd like to highlight three areas in particular of disruption in the EU that we believe create significant opportunities for Irish business. The first is localization and changes in supply chains. Some of these are undoubtedly negative. Both Brexit and COVID have created significant challenges for global supply chains, including for Irish businesses. But there is a clear move in Europe by manufacturers in particular to strengthen the reliability of their supply chains so that they are more easily accessed from a geographic and regulatory and administrative administrative perspectives. In some cases, this involves new suppliers in the single market and ideally within the Eurozone. In other cases, though, it involves building new manufacturing facilities in Europe. In all cases, it creates the opportunity for Irish enterprise to embed themselves in these new supply chains as a country that, although we're on the northwest of Europe, we're at the absolute heart of European thinking and hugely positive to the European project. The second disruptor, if I can call it that, is the move to a green and digital future. And I'm cheating a little because that's actually two disruptors. Creating a Europe fit for a digital age is one of the EU Commission's six stated priorities for 2019 to 2024. This drive to focus on digital infrastructure, digitization of public services, and digital transformation of business is creating huge opportunities in cloud, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and many more digital accelerator areas. These are all markets where Ireland excels and our growing reputation as a key digital leader in Europe will serve us very well in this. Under the European Green Deal, the EU has set its sights on being the first climate neutral continent on the planet. This presents a major opportunity for European industry and hence Irish business by creating markets for clean technologies and products. This will have an impact across entire value chains in sectors such as energy, transport, construction, and of course, the products and services that support these and other industries. And the third area of opportunity I'd like to highlight this morning are the national recovery and resilience plans currently being put into place by governments across the EU. Next Generation EU is the EU's plan to invest, coupled with the EU's long-term budget, over 2 trillion euros to make Europe greener, more digital, and more resilient. This is the largest stimulus package ever financed in Europe. The key element will see the European Commission borrow up to 750 billion euros from capital markets to provide resources to help push the green and digital transformations. These funds will be spent through grants and loans for which member states need to submit national recovery and resilience plans. Member states are required to allocate at least 37% for green, and 20% 20, 20 for digital transition projects. The remaining 40% can be allocated to any other priority, but focused on resilience and recovery. In addition, each member state has committed investment in a range of their own national priority issues. This increased investment in the European Union member states represents a pipeline of new opportunities for all business, including Irish companies operating across the room. And I have spoken a lot about exporting because that's what's most frequently on our minds. And it is a really important source of income for Ireland and for Irish businesses. However, trade, if it's going to be effective, has to be a two-way street. Irish businesses employ over 230,000 people across mainland Europe. That's actually an employment contribution larger than the entire employment base of the same companies in Ireland. Business is also relationship building and it's collaboration. We'd encourage companies as they look at Europe to look at a partnership model when developing your business. I expect this is something we'll hear more about this morning. 
In addition, good businesses need access to talent and skills, to reliable supply chains, to funding and investment opportunities, as well as access to markets. Our membership of the EU gives us access to all that across the European Union. So in conclusion, we are ambitious for Irish enterprise and for the Eurozone. And we believe that the Eurozone is central to future growth. Our membership of the EU and our adoption of the Euro gives us the full benefits of the biggest free trade agreement in the world and access to a market of 340 million people operating on just one currency. It's almost 50 years since Ireland joined the European Economic Community in 1973, and it's nearly 20 years since we adopted the Euro. Our membership has had a significant influence in transforming Ireland from a country that in the 1950s believed protectionism was its best option to one of the most open economies globally. And we have made great progress in this market, but it is still relatively untapped, and that represents enormous opportunity, and it's very exciting particularly in the context of the changing supply chains and the drive to a green and digitized world. Our reputation for dynamic companies with highly sought after and innovative solutions and a flexible approach to business put us in a great position to reap the benefits of the biggest free trading area in the world. So I'm really looking forward to the discussions this morning. I'd like to thank Michael Collins, Director General of the IIEA, and it was a pleasure to meet you this morning, Michael. Dan O'Brien, Chief Economist, and the entire team at the IIEA for their support in organizing this forum here today, and also to congratulate them on what is their 30th anniversary year for the excellent work they do in supporting much stronger ties with Europe from an Ireland perspective. I'd like to particularly thank our guest speakers this morning, Tobias, Bika, Greg, John, and Michael. And I want to especially acknowledge my colleague, Anne Lanigan, our Director of Europe at Enterprise Ireland, who's worked so hard to make this series a success. But most of all, thank you, the Irish business people in the audience. Your hard work and dedication, that is the foundation of this economy, is hugely appreciated. And it is a privilege for us at Enterprise Ireland to serve you. And of course, don't hesitate to reach out to Enterprise Ireland in the Eurozone if we could be of assistance. Thank you, Dan. Many thanks, Leo. Many thanks for those kind words and also for the wider scene setting that you've done for the event this morning. Now we're going to move to our panel discussion of people involved in business across the continent. Uh, we have four speakers this morning from a range of different, different perspectives who uh, will initially open with uh, a few minutes setting out their own situations, uh, giving you some idea of what they do and their backgrounds. Uh, and then we'll have hopefully a very rich discussion amongst that panel. Uh, and you're also invited to, to send in questions via the Zoom function at the bottom of your screen. Let me briefly introduce the four panelists. We have Greg Kane. He has worked in the fintech industry for 26 years and has been directly involved in client technology initiatives on the ground in 62 countries in operational consulting, commercial and management roles. Before joining Monex Financial Services, Greg held positions with Digital Equipment Corporation, Missy's International Banking System, CR2, Central and uh, Finergo. A graduate of Trinity College, Dublin, Greg lives and works in Dublin and Dubai, where he holds a secondary role as the general manager of Monex Middle East. He's a regular speaker and participant in global financial industry events. Tobias Lund was born in, uh, is a German. After finishing his master's in business and economics in 2005, he began his career in Ireland, working with Hertz Car Rentals. He returned to Germany in 2008 uh, and has worked in different sales and logistics ro roles until he began working for Water Wipes, an Irish company in 2017. At Water Wipes, Tobias is responsible for business development in various markets and is currently country manager Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and Poland. John Power is Managing Director of SGL, a strategic financial advisory firm providing services such as strategic financial planning, outsourced CFOs, outsourced CFO services, funding, and treasury advisory to the SME sector. John is an experienced finance professional who, along with his SGL team, specializes in working with SMEs on their financial strategy and implementation. He has spent over 20 years working in financial services and advisory firms, developing a deep understanding of financial markets and uh, the uh, financial markets and the landscape, the participants and the various challenges faced 
by Irish SMEs. Last but not least, we have Vicky Bangorp, uh, founder, uh, co-founder and COO of FibriCheck. After completing her master's in business administration at the, at the Catholic University of Leuven and a master's in finance at Leuven School of Business and Economics, Becky became a member, um, I, I began a career in mergers and acquisitions with BNP Paribas Fortis in Brussels, Amsterdam, Paris, and New York. Over the past seven years, BK has built up a, an extensive, has built up extensive experience in the digital health space, uh, pioneering the FibriCheck, uh, responsible for businesses and marketing, Vicky has successfully rolled out various business models, including multiple collaborations with international blue chip companies, uh, reimbursement tracks, and a successful B2C implementation. So with that, as I say, I'd like to go to each of the panelists for some introductory opening, brief opening uh, remarks to set the scene uh, about their uh, experiences, their organization uh, on the relevant topic of, of expanding in, in European continental European markets. In alphabetical order, may I go to Greg Kane first. Greg, the floor is yours. Um, so Monix is a fintech which operates in the in the in the card payments uh, space, specifically in in the area of multi currency payments and and and, and treasury uh, FX activities related to that. Uh, my role is um, commercial director for uh, EMEA and the Americas. I, I am based in Dubai. I've been um, at, a, at the side of a rugby pitch in 40 degrees of heat since five o'clock Irish time this morning. So my day's well underway here. Um, Monex, I joined Monex in um, 2011. And since then, we have tripled worldwide profits and um, uh, increased European profits by a multiple of about four. Um, we've grown from a position where we were working with a handful of financial institutions in Europe in 2011 to today, where our services are used by over uh, 30 institutions on continental Europe. Um, we've also established during that time uh, new business in three additional continents where we weren't present before, but we're not here to talk about that today. Um, also in Europe at the moment, we've got a 10 country uh, contract with a large European financial institution underway, which will contribute significantly to our um, to our bottom line. So for me, I've got responsibility for, for multiple areas of the world, but the one where I actually like to work most is Europe, because I find we can be more predictably successful in Europe. Uh, I find that and, and, and I'm taking this really from a sales perspective and, 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 you know, in terms of running a business, my view would be, you know, if the sales part is right, then you can invest your way out of an operational issue, you know, I, 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 and I think everybody knows you've got to get the sales right. IBM is IBM because good people sold IBM technology early in its growth and throughout its growth. So really what I'm talking about today is really purely the, the, the sales side of things. So what we find is in other parts of the world, when we're in a sales process, we have to kind of ask ourselves two things, you know, will this client buy this solution or service from me? And will this client buy this solution or service from anyone because a lot of a, a lot of procurement or, or, or evaluation processes which which kick off around the world never really result in anybody be, being awarded a piece of business what we find is generally in europe if a prospective client embarks on a, a, an evaluation process it will result in somebody being awarded the business so and of course then you know as a as a as a as, as a commercial organization, your job is to make sure that your, your organization is the one that wins the business. Our business in Europe, the business that we've, that we've, that we've achieved has really been, I would say, 50% direct and 50% via partner channels. And it's the partner channel piece that I'd like to talk about today, because I think the partner channel piece is the piece that other people can probably um, replicate. Um, so if you think I think there's there's often an element of naivety among uh, Irish companies that just our Irishness and and, and our likability as, as as a people 
you know, it, it, it means that there's people all over the world waiting for a, a, an Irish company to arrive and sell them some great stuff. It, it, that, that isn't the case, as we know. You know, there, there are great companies all over the world who've already got lots of great relationships. And as, a, as an Irish or as an unknown Irish organization, particularly a tech like Monix, there's the challenge that you receive a request for proposal in the door. Your first question is, should I respond to it? And your second challenge is, there's a, there's a request for proposal there. There's a eight or 12 week sales process. And you've then got to build a relationship through that, that, that tender process to try to win the business when actually building relationships is kind of against the rules of a tender process once it started. So what we did was, you know, from 2011 onwards, we, we looked at organizations which had a proper logical, commercial, functional fit for, for, for what we provide. And they're, they're European giants. And we selected our giants well, and then we proceeded to stand on the shoulders of those giants. And so what we do is we're, 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 we're enhancing their product offering. And it brought us to a position where we've managed to avoid tender processes all over the world, and particularly in Europe, because we've positioned ourselves as an additional module of an incumbent system which doesn't require a tender process. So, you know, there, there are countries where we've, we've won 100% market shares without having to participate in tender processes at all because of that strategy. Now, there's, there's, a bit of, there's a bit of trust in that. You know, you've got to trust a company which was unknown to you a couple of years ago to, uh, to license your solutions, to resell your solutions. We kind of approached it in a phased basis where we started with organizations introducing us and eventually reached a point where they were able to license, um, license our technologies directly to their clients. And uh, so commercially, in terms of uh, avoiding competitive tender processes, which always put pressure on your pricing, that's been a very successful thing for us. The other thing that it's managed to achieve is we, we basically, we've got, we've got pre-packaged solutions. Instead of us arriving into a financial institution and starting an integration process, we've, we, it enables us to effectively pre-integrate. So for Monex, our typical implementation time, technical implementation time with a new client would be eight to 12 weeks. Through that partner model and the pre-integration model, we've really cut that short to the extent that our most recent partner um, go live was with uh, a bank in Northern Europe, and we actually completed the implementation in three days. So from, from 12 weeks to three days. What I'd say in relation to, I'll just take about another 90 seconds if that's okay, Dan. What I'd say in relation to partner management is it, it's not, it's, it's not macho elephant hunter sales stuff. And partner management is often kind of seen as a home for failed salespeople or a school for a new salespeople. And I think that's, well, our experience has shown that that's absolutely wrong. You, if, you, if you get a sale right to the right partner and that partner properly accepts you, um, then you, you've done 10 sales in, in, in that one move. So what you've got to do is you've got to, you've, got to, you've got to really give it the gas. You've got to really give it the time. You know, I remember my first big deal in, in, in Europe in 2008. I'd been, I'd been in Africa and other places until that time. You know, we, of, of 14 meetings maybe with, in, in the pre-sale process with the client, nine of those were with a partner strategizing about how we were going to do things. So my advice would be apply your best people to, to, to establishing partner sales channels. Um, give, it some, give it some real real objective thought. And what you may find is you may find that one of your best partner options might actually be a competitor or ostensibly a competitor, but which has one solution gap that you might fill. Uh, and I, I've, uh, I've, I've seen it, I've seen it, you know, I've seen, I've seen one particular Irish organization, which was really struggling in competition with the UK organization. And I just happened to, to be sitting with the guy one evening and we talked about it and, and, and he had, a, he had one really nifty component, which his partner didn't have, or which is, which his competitor didn't have this organization, which he hated. And he, he eventually found a, 
a mechanism to have a proper conversation with them. And they actually just took that component and he made more money from them selling that component than he had made from all of the other aspects of his business. So, and I suppose, you know, the last thing I'd say on it is, you know, what, what you're doing, what you're doing in establishing a partner channel is you're asking large European organizations. It, it might be, it might be Cap Gemini in the Netherlands, you know, it, it, it might be Atos Origin in, 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 in Belgium. You're asking large organizations to trust you with their clients. So that's 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 a bigger sell than selling your own software or services or or, or, or hardware or whatever it might be to one client. So it really does merit uh, proper consideration, effort, um, and energy. And and it, and it and it also needs to work. We've all heard before, you know, the is it better to have a hundred percent of of nothing or eighty percent of something? We all know the answer to that. So you've got to come up with salute with with partner structures which work operationally and functionally but also financially so you know one of the things that i that i an, an early conversation that i'll have with the, with a senior person in a prospective partner organization is how much is it going to cost me for you to take a call from me at 8 a.m you know and, and if and if and if and if i don't have that right then it's just not going to work it really and and i guess to finish off i'll say what we see elsewhere in the world is we'll, we'll, we'll talk to potential partner organizations who are really just collecting logos for their business cards. The, the partnerships in Europe, if you, if you get an organization at the, of the right scale and commitment and you get it right, it, it'll just run itself. Um, and, and you'll hopefully find yourselves in a, in, in, a much, uh, in a much sharper position when it comes to avoiding, particularly avoiding competitive processes. Um, I'll be here for the rest of the of the of the hour if there's any questions, etc. Many, many I'm thanks, Greg. Just an opening one, if I may. How do you find the partners that you approach, and, and how do you approach them? Um, the, you know, there's no there's no magic wand. You know, Dan, it's it, it, there's it, it, it's it's a lot of it is really sitting back. You know, you, you need to you need to have people who know the industry and and know who's doing what and and research that industry and and take a few months over it potentially but we 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 attend a lot of conferences i speak at a lot of conferences um you know it, the, i suppose the businesses that that i've worked in over my time are, are are businesses that probably have some sort of logical synergy to what i'm doing so it's 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 really about kind of sitting back and and, and looking at the people you've worked with previously because they're probably going to have moved off into into other organizations so you know, no, no, no silver bullet. It, it, but I would just say time and energy. Okay, that's great. Look, I'm sure we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit more as we go on. Uh, next up in alphabetical order is Tobias. As a uh, parent of a five-month-old baby, I have been using your products a lot <laughs> lately. So Happy looking, to forward, hear that. <laughs> looking, looking forward Happy to uh, hearing uh, hearing your experiences and thoughts. Thanks a lot, and thanks for the introduction also, and uh, good morning to everyone here. Um, yeah, as then uh, said, I'm working for a Waterwipes. Waterwipes is um, an Irish company producing one single product, a very unique, with a very unique technique, a baby wipe. Um, and this is very different to other baby wipes in the market. That's why the, the, that is one part actually of, of the success. And if you ask me why should Irish companies expand to continental Europe or um, to Eurozone in, uh, specifically, I can just give um, uh, water wipes as, as good example how it can go if, if you make this decision. The water wipes way before 2016, 2017 was exactly the way I believe a lot of um, companies in fast moving consumer goods, Irish companies in fast moving consumer go goods or any other uh, sector took uh, expanding from Ireland where they have launched the product very successfully to the UK and in a second step um, to the US both very successful but then in at, at one point um, growth is is limited so the the logical decision to, to my understanding also for for water wipes was to go to to continental Europe 
and that was a very successful move. So 2017, when, when I joined, there was um, a turnover in, in Eurozone, very little um, coming from some, um, some companies actually seeing the product in, in the UK market and uh, contacting uh, water wipes. Can I have a pellet area? Can I have a container here? So starting there from a turnover of around 2 million, and we will finish this year uh, already with a turnover in the EMEA zone that is not only Europe, but main part is, is coming from, from Europe with uh, around 30 million. So uh, that is a quarter of, of the total business result at, at the end of this year. We have been able to open up uh, 35 markets in, in this the four years, coming of course with a, with a lot of complexity also. And there I can just say, and, and we learned this also, choose your battles well. If you, if you want to expand, um, do your homework before, ch choose the markets you want to go and which, which fit to you. Not every product is suitable for, for every market, for every consumer. Um, another figure we have um, produced uh, for, for the European market uh, in 2017, around one and a half million packs. It will be more than 20 million this year. So. From, from this point of view, I can only encourage <laughs> Irish companies to, to go a similar way if the product is suitable and, and if they are willing. And that, I believe, is a story of success of, of water wipes. It is a very a, a product with a very good uh, USP and, and fits in many markets. The, the timing has been very good because at this time, when we uh, started expanding to Europe, there was no similar product in the market. Um, and also the idea has to be, or th there has to be the ability and also the willing to invest in the markets. But if these three main pillars are given, I believe Europe with all the advantages we heard this morning from, from Leo um, and, and um, hearing that it's five times uh, bigger than, than UK, only the Eurozone. And if you are in Europe, you have access to the retailers which sell also outside the eurozone if you go to a to a rossmann in, in germany you have also most probably access to to a rossmann in, in poland even though if it is it is another another market also a drugstore like muller is uh, selling from uh, germany or from german account to to many other eastern european markets um and um to finish uh, my, my, my five minutes introduction, I can just echo what, what Greg said, try to find the right partner. The, the European markets are, are very complex and, and are all very unique. And of course, there is a language barrier. So for, for especially for the beginning, it is very important to have uh, the, the right local partner at site who can uh, guide you with consumer needs, who has perhaps better access to data, um, is aware of, of local registration because it can also vary from market to market, even within uh, the Eurozone or uh, the European Union. Yeah, also here for the rest of the panel discussion for hopefully many questions. Great, Tobias, many thanks uh, for that. A couple, couple of questions. I'm, I'm curious about the different markets in, in Europe, the different national markets, which ones did you find easier to, to access and which ones were a little more difficult and what were the reasons behind that? So um, in ma markets uh, to easier access um, was, for example, France, I believe, because the, 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 um, the product was very suitable there for, for a special channel, for, for a pharmacy channel. Um, a premium price level was, was better accepted. Uh, market harder to access was, was, for example, Germany, but also Spain because of a very low price um, 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 consumer expectations in this baby wipes category. Um, and, and that's what I mean with saying not every product is suitable for every market. Fascinating. Interesting. We might pick up on that uh, and uh, those different consumer preferences, pricing issues later on in, in the discussion. Uh, John Power. John. Floor is yours. Thanks, Dan. Um, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks to Dan and the IIEA and Enterprise Ireland for putting on this uh, this important webinar. Um, 
from my point of view, I come at it from a slightly different point of, uh, perspective uh, to our other three panelists in that we are a corporate finance consultancy. We've been working now for uh, uh, well over five years with Enterprise Ireland, uh, working with client companies, both in the private sector semi, um, uh, 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 and the semi-state sector, uh, but particularly with those who are exporting SMEs. Our, our focus is working with SMEs, and I think we've worked with hundreds of companies at this stage, particularly as we saw in 2016, the, the Brexit vote came out and the impact that currency at that time was having on uh, Irish SMEs uh, trading with the UK. So who SGL are, we are a team of industry focused finance professionals. So uh, way back, we identified that we, want, we, we saw that Irish SMEs really needed to improve their finance capability. And we saw an opportunity and a need to help Irish SMEs. So what we provide is we provide strategic financial planning, forecasting and budgeting services. We focus very much so on the funding and treasury support. Um, and again, as I said, we, we focus our attention on that SME market uh, who require the assistance more than anybody. So what I'm gonna try and bring this morning is our experience of working with the hundreds of SMEs we've worked with and the impact that particularly currency can have on an SME, the need for it to be managed, but more importantly, the importance of understanding how lucky we are in the Eurozone with having a single currency and being members of the Eurozone market, which as everybody says is the, is the largest free trade area in the world. Uh, we're a strategic location for that uh, single market. We are members of that single currency. And I think I, where I'll probably focus this morning is on the impact that, that being members of that single currency can have on a company's margin. And we focus constantly on margin. So I'm listening to the guys talking about sales and, 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 uh, and, and, you know, and developing sales, but our focus is on maintaining that sales, converting it to margin, converting it to positive margin, and, and, and moving that uh, into, into profit and bottom line. So I think that's where I'll focus this morning. And I'm really open to any questions, Dan, uh, in, in terms of uh, how companies want to develop that, that, uh, that, that, that market in the EU, uh, the potential impact it has on their margin by being members of that uh, single currency uh, and, and the difference it can make to the bottom line, to that margin. Uh, and the impact that currency volatility has on a company through the sales cycle. Uh, we're looking at peak to trough. If we take the, if we take the UK uh, and the pound at the moment, we're looking at peak to trough, even from April to, to August, we're looking at peak to trough moves on that currency of in around, you know, seven, eight percent. For most SMEs, that is their net margin white. For a lot of trading companies, that is straight to bottom line. So the importance of understanding uh, the impact that being members of that single currency can have, that 7 or 8% is maintained by trading with the Eurozone and in the single currency. So that, that's where I'll focus this morning now. Thank you. Great. Thank you curiosity that struck me uh, while you were speaking, John, the range of margins of the companies that you deal with. It's interesting. You can have a SaaS business um, that can generate, you know, uh, quite high levels of even net margin, 30, 40%. Very often, they're not overly concerned about right. any type of currency volatility. But if we take our, our, our SME who's trading in any type of commodity, Product. We're talking about tight, tight net margins, three, five, seven percent. So managing currency and the impact that has on, on margin, particularly if we look at uh, pre-10 years ago, we would have seen relatively lower levels of volatility in currency. But in the last 10 years, and, and you know yourself, Dan, as, as an economist, we're seeing quite high levels of currency volatility you know, 10% annually is a, is a common occurrence now. But if you're, if you're trading very often multiple currencies, so 
you're buying in dollar, you're selling in sterling. Now you've got multiple relationships and, and, and you've now got to manage multi-currency cash flows. You could see a 15, 20% swing on both sides of that transaction very easily through the sales cycle. And being able to protect that at the, at the other end, at the sales end, in terms of being able to sell into the Eurozone, where you no longer have to worry about the hedge. You know, for a lot of Irish companies, they are experienced in, he in hedging strategies because we've been dealing with the US and, uh, and the UK for so long. But those hedging strategies generally carry a cost. And there is an embedded cost in there of the overhead, the transaction cost. And then thirdly, if you do have a hedging strategy, you, you will more than likely have to place deposit uh, if you're buying forwards. And you will also have the cost of that of that forward and embedded in there in terms of the credit cost that's in there. So, so there is a cost. Uh, it does protect, but there is a cost. Okay, we might go into a little more detail about the costs of hedging uh, later on. But to to finalise our our opening round of of speakers on on the panel, uh, we it's a pleasure to go to you, BK. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, for having me. So my name is uh, is Bika. I'm one of the co-founders of um, of Compium, a Belgian company that we started back in uh, 2014. Um, within Compium, we have actually two business units. One is Extra Horizon, where we offer a, a medical backend as a service to other companies that want to bring their medical devices faster to the market. But actually, we learned everything with FibriCheck, um, a digital application, mobile application that we uh, built ourselves to um, detect cardiac arrhythmias just using smartphones or smartwatches with a clear call to prevent strokes. Um, today, uh, we are a team of, uh, of 40 people um, across the, the different business units and uh, FibriCheck has been used by over 600,000 uh, people um, globally. Initially being a Belgian company, I would say that of course we focused on our, on our home market, but as with Ireland, I mean, the home market is, is rather small. So you know that you need to, to scale fast uh, to, to make it work. And um, like many, and, and certainly from a B2C perspective, we looked immediately towards the, the UK and to the US given, um, yeah, both the size, but also the, the language um, which was uh, which was easier and and certainly for the UK it, it turned out to be a good strategy, but then when it came to to partnerships um, and so mainly B two B collaborations, we did learn that for us um, this tend to go better in uh, in Europe, um, and we also learned that we needed partnerships as initially we tried to roll out a kind of direct sales approach ourselves, but. Yeah, basically we we failed the the product. I mean, Fibrichek was too small to to do it all ourselves. So we just realized we needed partners. And I would say to to structure our, our efforts, what we tried to do was always to work with with blue ship companies that were present in in different countries, build up a relationship with uh, with them. Certainly looked for um, internal champions, which was very very important for us. Um, and then started within one country, moving uh, to other countries. Very concretely, um, on our side as a small company, we have uh, collaborations, for example, with uh, with Roche, with uh, with Pfizer, um, with Daichi Sankyo. And although these companies, of course, are not all European, we do feel that most of the of the partnerings are within within Europe, or certainly started within within Europe based on um, connections and, um, and fit. So for us, that, that proved to be um, a very good model. And of course, with the partnering, they could support us as well in, in localization, because I, I heard it a couple of times, but it's very important to assure that the, the product is, is localized, certainly in, um, in its communication towards the end users, of course, in its language. Um, so there we had a big support from our partners as well. Uh, because one of the again, what that, that that question about how you you mentioned blue chip, you like to look to to deal with blue chip companies and find internal champions within those companies to work with. Um, easier said than done. 
Um, how do you go about that? Um, I, I think for us, it, it took, of course, a, a couple of steps. So you need to have uh, certainly a, a proof level. You, you need to have your product um, in the market. In our case, I mean, clinically um, proved, adopted uh, to, yeah, to be able to knock on the door. Um, but, but basically, with a couple of them, we were able to get in through Accelerate programs that they organized themselves because often also on their side, they want to, to collaborate with smaller companies and, and do the best, I would say, of, um, of both, uh, both worlds. And then for us, actually, with, with all of them, it was truly finding about the internal champions that we really, really need to bring us further internally because the structures are so challenging. Um, and when you truly have somebody that can basically attach their career to a successful collaboration with you, uh, you know that you're on the on the right spot and then you need to invest a lot of time and effort to bring it towards a success. But as I think Greg already said, I mean, by bringing it to a success, it can be more easily translated and to, for example, um, other countries, um, often within Europe, and then by, yeah, doing one uh, one line you get actually way uh, way more business opportunities um than doing it like yeah i would say step by step or with different partners and the, the champions that you have within these bigger companies do they tend to be on the sales side um not necessarily we try always to have like a couple of champions but in our case of course being very a clinical and medical product we also like to have like uh, clinical champions champions on the on the medical uh, medical side but also on the business side so yes there is always business people um in involved uh but in our case it are not the only champions Okay, good. So um, we've got a half an hour to discuss things. If anyone has any thoughts about what any of the other panelists have said, uh, would welcome any um, developing those conversations at all. Uh, I know we've got a couple of questions in already from the audience, so we'll also put those questions. Um, but just to, to kick things off, and as I say, each of the panelists are very much welcome if you have a response to anything the other panelists have said, but that issue of market differentiation within Europe, we may be in a single market, but clearly there are linguistic barriers, there are cultural barriers, there's a whole range of things that make uh, doing business in Sweden different from doing business in Spain. Uh, I wonder if any of you, uh, Tobias has touched on this with his product, I wonder if any of the three of you have any thoughts on on that and the differences and the difficulties and the costs of, of, of differentiating. Greg? Yeah, um, so something I should have mentioned Dan earlier um, is one of, the, one, of the, one of the ways we found quite effective in, uh, in, in identifying partnerships is through EI actually, through the, EI, um, through the EI local offices and some of them have been really helpful to us in finding the right partner organizations. Uh, and, and again, we, we, you gotta kiss a lot of frogs till you find a prince sometimes, you know, but, so you might, you, might, uh, you, 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 might, you might talk to 10 organizations and eventually find one that works. Uh, in relation to differentiate different market experiences, um, look, for us, the big thing is, um, as a tech, you know, for us, the, the big thing is, uh, you know, will a, a potential client, buy a solution or build one and there are areas on the continent of Europe where builds in-house builds are more likely so there are there are certain countries where you know we and this isn't going to be relevant to, to, to medical devices or to, or to the to the water wipes thing you know Carrefour it, well, Carrefour isn't going to it, it has its own line of wipes I guess but it's not going to try to copy yours specifically but in our in our business you know, as we go towards the east uh, of the continent, the likelihood of in-house builds uh, competing with our solution is it, it becomes a lot more of a concern for us. So the further east we go, the more likely we are to see an organization listening to our ideas, saying it's really good, asking us for a whole bunch of information and then building it themselves. You're on mute, Dan. Still making that error, excuse me. Uh, Biki, was interested in your point uh, about expansion and the expansion to the UK and the US for language reasons. Now, 
most of us are envious of, of, of you uh, Flemish folk who can speak perfect English, French, Dutch, and often German as well. I was interested that, that UK and US was mentioned before Germany, uh, a, a country, a big market right on your border you can drive over to in, 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 short, in a short time. Just might explain to us, was the UK and the US pre preferenced over Germany, for example? And was that a language issue? Um, I would say, yeah, partly, of course, it, it was um, a language element for sure. Um, but also, um, we were quite early in the digital health space. With, with Fibrishek, I mean, we're often seen as a, as, a, as a pioneer being so early. And I would say at that point in time, because of course, by now time, things have changed. Um, the UK and US were, were more open towards it, more adaptable towards it. Its, its users were more adaptable towards it. Certainly in the B2C context, we still feel it today. Um, they are more prepared to pay it themselves for it based on how the healthcare markets are working. So I think it's both a matter of how markets are working, uh, language barriers, um, but certainly not only um, language barriers. Okay. And in terms of competition and openness to competition, openness to new entrants, uh, have you found a difference in <clears throat> culture and difficulties across the European market? Are some markets more welcoming of competition and is it more difficult to access certain other markets? I think being like, again, but this is very specific, I think for, for the healthcare space, right. um, mm. I do feel that a lot of countries like local companies as, as much as possible. I mean, it's, it's healthcare data. It's, I mean, it's very sensitive elements, but again, there, I mean, with time, you, you feel that this is, uh, this is opening, opening up. Um, so maybe for us, the, the, the French market was a little bit more protective on, um, on that side. Um, but overall, I think, um, if, if I just speak in, in, in the now and, and today, uh, no, most markets are, are certainly open to, to international, uh, companies. And we do feel often that they prefer actually to have like European countries. There you do feel the, the connection, which I mean, I think is a very positive element for, um, for European companies as well. We, we often have it when we um, are in discussions in, yeah, in a European context um, that the other side likes to have European companies uh, as well at the table. And, and maybe there we even have like a small advantage compared to non-European countries, companies, sorry. Interesting, interesting. John, I'd like to, to come to you in terms of the, your experience of, of businesses across different um, countries within the single market. Uh, any particular thoughts on, on, on those, on the differentiation strategies or countries that you found easiest to, to break into and build, build, uh, build client base? Yeah, a lot of the client companies we have seem to, they seem to have a preference to enter Europe via uh, the Netherlands. They probably find it the easiest country to trade in, uh, the more open to trade. Um, I'm, I'm interested on Tobias's comment earlier because we've seen that as well in that what a number of the client companies we have done, uh, we have, what they've done is they've leveraged the relationship maybe with one large customer and that one large customer then introduces them to maybe one or two other markets in the Eurozone. So leveraging um, that one initial relationship, if it's a really large uh, partner, uh, as Greg has mentioned, if it's a really large partner, we're seeing a lot of the smaller SMEs that we would deal with who will struggle to, to develop uh, in the Eurozone. Um, they will leverage that one initial uh, customer or partner they have to almost infiltrate the other markets in the Eurozone. And again, I know I'm probably, uh, I'm probably telling everyone how to suck eggs here, but I would not underestimate the power of having eight offices around Europe from Enterprise Ireland. And I don't think it's possibly leveraged enough in that, you know, you have events run in those local markets and you have opportunities to meet other customers. And by leveraging your existing customers along with local market presence from EI, I think that's how a lot of companies that we've seen have managed to penetrate that European market. 
Interesting, interesting. Uh, uh, Tobias, maybe come over, come over to you. Your 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 business is is slightly unusual in the in the sense that you have a single product. Um, I think at a previous event we've done here, uh, there was um, advice on um, trying to expand product range as a way of generating extra revenue. So as I say, slight maybe uh, unusual in a company that you focus on one single product. What what are your growth strategies? Um, and, and have you found in some markets that you've really saturated the market um, and it's difficult to grow further? So the growth, growth strategy um, of the business is, is clearly um, in, in the markets we are already uh, existing and, and they are to become number two, uh, number three uh, baby wipes brand um, with the right level of invest behind it, with the right um, uh, distribution expansion behind it. Um, be, besides, having so much uh, headroom for growth in, in the existing channels and existing business and, and in the core, with the core product, we are also working on uh, uh, still on um, the expansion of the rate uh, range. Um, yeah, for example, it is possible to have um, wipes uh, for refreshing or wipes for on the go. Um, it is possible to have the same technology for uh, wipes for um, carers, so for, for adults, uh, not just for babies. That is um, directions in, in which the business thinks at the moment. I would quickly like to come back to the to the question how to find the right partners because I think it's it's a very important one. Sure. And um, uh, in in our um, case, we um, we work together with with uh, local distributors. So so the uh, a local partner which has the access then to retail because we cannot have uh, an office or an entity in, in every market we, we are present in. And also, as, as I said earlier, the, the knowledge of these partners is, is very, very important and the connections are, of course, very, very important. Um, and how, how did we find them? And I, I have also to say, like, like John mentioned, um, Enterprise Island was a big help here. Enterprise Island is very well connected. Uh, you can use the offices, you can use uh, their, their networks. It, it was an extreme help. Besides that, there is always um, local chamber of commerces in, in, in Germany, for example, which offer similar services. And what also was very helpful and what brought us a lot of contacts is visiting fairs, having either a booth on, on a trade show, on a trade fair, on a congress, or just uh, walking over it and, and talking to people in, fr from the same um, category. That was how, how we find or found the right partners in the market. Great, and if anybody wants to come in there, I've got a question from the audience I'll put to you. Uh, Greg, did you want, was your hand up there? Yeah, just to say, it, it one thing that we found that can work really well in terms of identifying a partner or who the players are, and EI has helped us with this a lot, is to get an hour with a KPMG person or an Accenture person in a country. You know, that to sit down with somebody and just work out who likes who, who hates who here, who, you know, you go into a company, you go into a country like Slovakia, you know, and in, and in Slovakia, there was a really good uh, Irish guy uh, uh, was a partner in one of the big consultant organizations. <laughs> I, 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 I spent an hour with that guy and I, it was like doing an MBA in Slovakian currents of thought, you know. So it, it, that, those places are a really good place to start. And again, and, and, and you know, somebody from Accenture or KPMG or, you know, they're always glad to, to speak to a, to somebody coming in from outside with new ideas as well. So it's something that you'll, you'll get for free. And that's a, that's probably the, 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 the quick Quickest best way to start to, to work out who's who. Okay, I'm, I'm, I suspect a lot of the uh, participants are scribbling that one down as a as a takeaway from this morning's event. Uh, look, let's go to some of the questions. We have Silvana Landa McAdam, who is the who's from the Irish Lux, Luxury Accessories Company, and uh, she asks about the retail scene uh, post pandemic. How important is maintaining physical presence? Clearly, a lot of um, Purchases have gone online during the pandemic. She asks, in your respective businesses, in your experience, how important is the retail experience? Uh, maybe Tobias, go with you. For that. Yeah, maybe I take up on this one. Um, yes, it is true uh, that what that's what we have also seen that um, people tend to buy more online. That was already before the pandemic the, the case. That online channel was the fastest growing one. 
and um, yeah, COVID helped uh, online channel very much. Um, but still, um, I, I can talk about uh, our um, uh, category. Still, the, the, the main part is, is offline. Still, uh, a, depends from market to market, but let's say around 80% is, is, is offline sales. So yes, it is extremely important to be present there and uh, don't underestimate the, uh, the, um, that the consumer actually finds your product uh, usually, of course, also online through research, but us usually when, when going shopping and on shelf, that, that, is, uh, that is the main uh, communication space and, and the, the, the better visibility you have there and the better distribution you have there offline, um, the, the higher is, is uh, the mental availability of, of your product. Okay, uh, BK, in terms of retail presence, um, are you all online or do you do you have a retail store presence? No, we are completely digital. So okay. yeah, no experience on the retail side. Okay, good. Okay. Um, another question from Manus Rooney. Uh, he directs his question to you, uh, John. Uh, he notes very correctly that uh, trade figures, uh, import export figures show that Irish SMEs are importing less from the UK post Brexit, uh, dramatically less. Um, Ireland sources a lot of raw materials from the UK. However, he asks, revenues still remain in sterling. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of FX exposure? Better, worse? Thoughts on the future, he asks. You're muted there, John. Yeah, good question from Manus. Um, so uh, just about five years ago, there was a concerted effort to promote with Irish SMEs to begin the process of looking at their supply chains and perhaps moving to a more EU-centric supply chain base and to begin to move away from uh, so much reliance on the UK. Uh, and we're seeing, I think we're seeing the manifestation of that now where you're seeing you know import figures from the uk I, I, particularly with the introduction now post brexit of both tariff and customs from the uk that has accelerated um uh, the need for irish companies to begin to source supply chains more openly from mainland europe however as Manus rightly points out we're still reliant on the uk in terms of revenue because that's a traditional market for us uh, so the exposure now is generally, it's either e, it's either euro or dollar on the supply side, um, with still a significant export exposure to sterling uh, on the revenue side. Um, I see I see sterling possibly, and it's impossible to predict here, but you could see possibly sterling being left weakened, left continue to weak, to make the UK more competitive on their uh, on their own side. Um, I think Irish companies will continue to explore um, the supply the supply chain on their on the EU side, but that revenue uh, that margin protection on the on sterling I think could possibly weaken in the coming years, and that UK market may not be as attractive as it once was uh, in terms of in terms of profit. Um, forget about revenue, but in terms of profit. Uh, I think it may not be as attractive uh, in the in the short to medium term. Irish companies have so much pressure from a cost point of view coming at them at the moment. We're seeing significant increases in supply chain costs on materials. We're all hearing about it at the moment. We have upward pressure on labour in the Irish market. Uh, we have uh, potentially a higher inflation, as you well know, Dan. It's certainly in the short term forecasted interest rates may well increase. So there's lots of pressure coming at Irish SMEs at the moment. And again, the whole point of this session is around developing the EU. And by, and, and, and by taking advantage of, again, the single currency and eliminating some of that uncertainty, it can only be a good thing. Um, I will say to one of the other questions earlier on retail, somebody mentioned retail. There is, there is certainly, uh, particularly for online retail, so B2C, um, you are seeing, I think, EU customers starting to focus in on where can I buy my goods in the Eurozone 
where I, where I traditionally may have bought them from the UK. They're seeing those costs now come through because unlike a business, it's passed fully on to the consumer. So those consumers are actively now looking for uh, EU-centric, uh, EU-based uh, suppliers where they don't have to carry any of the customs or tariff costs on the import. So, and we're seeing, we saw with Amazon, you know, introducing a big warehouse into Ireland, that's going on across the Eurozone. Irish SMEs can definitely benefit uh, from that move uh, that's going on at the moment. And a follow up question, slightly different tack, John, but a question on, on uh, regulation uh, in your industry, issues around anti money laundering, all that sort of thing. It, it, do you find it uniform across uh, across the European Union or do you find maybe some countries gold plate EU level legislation and it becomes more onerous in some countries than others? So that issue as a, as a, as a financial services provider, do you find it different in different countries the way uh, regulations are, are both uh, introduced and applied. Yeah, I mean, Ireland is probably one of those gold-plated countries now in terms of regulation. We, we've we gone from a scenario of maybe like much 15 years ago, quite heavy touch now, and you're seeing it in particularly in the banking sector at the moment and, and how we regulate our, our banks and the capital requirements in there. Uh, we do have home and host and passporting across the, the EU. Um, without getting into too much detail, it's pretty uniform across the EU. You do have the UK coming out of it now. But they do have a transition period in terms of regulation, but what that will look like post-transition period, um, only time will tell. Dan. Okay, Greg, I'd sort of get get your perspective on that similar that question, similar space. Yeah, so can, can we just come back to just, just one thing that was asked by Silvana there a, a minute ago that we didn't, oh, there was something I just wanted to add to that. It was in relation to the retail uh, point. So, um, so but two things to contribute there. So firstly, we are in the fortunate position, Monix as an organization, we have a, we have a, a software application that runs on pretty much every uh, point of sale terminal in the country of Portugal. So we have a, we have a pretty good, good view of what's going on there in, in those retail places and we, we do it there's a lot around luxury accessories and stuff and Sylvana yes um the you know we're seeing a, a, a strong recovery in 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 retail and shops particularly around uh, accessories and 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 but when you asked that your question was you know, do do we do we still do we do we hold the view that organizations should still seek presence in in retail locations for the products and you, you mentioned the Middle East so absolutely in the Middle East where I happen to be based, it's not the topic today, but it's 40 degrees outside here. Shopping centers are very much a part of the social fabric of the country. So if you want to get accessories into the Middle East, luxury accessories, you, you absolutely should have them in, 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 in retail stores. It's, it's, it's fundamental to family life here because people can't walk outside. The place where people go for a walk is in a shopping mall. So we're a little bit off topic, but there. Now, Dan, sorry, the, the, the other question was- Yeah, that, that issue about um, as a financial services provider, regulations across Europe is, is it helpful that there's, there's so much of the regulation is, is done at, at an EU level? So it's the same in different places or actually are things different? Um, do different national markets have different uh, regulatory standards, different different things that you need, barriers, difficulties in doing business? Um, for, 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 for Monix purposes, we've just had some legislation brought in by the EU, which it looked looked scary initially, but has worked out. We would say really well for us. So, so, and um, really, our so really our regulatory authorities day to day are Visa and Mastercard, which are global organisations. Okay. So, so for our purposes, what what we probably would experience would be more small technical, just localized technical issues as opposed to regulatory issues to, to, to be surmounted. For example, you know, some, some countries will have a, a massive big national transaction control system that that would that we that we'd have to connect to. So there wouldn't be legislation attached, but you might get a, a powerful local organization which would flex its muscles and maybe make an integration a little bit more difficult for us. Okay. Uh, but yeah. 
Good, 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 good. Look, we've, we're coming to the end of the panel session. Um, it, maybe if there's anything, anybody, uh, John, I see you, <laughs> you want to come in. Before we hand over to, to our, our final speaker, um, just final thoughts, if anybody has them. John, the uh, floor is yours. Yeah, just one other point, and it's actually going back to your last point, Dan, on, on regulation. Um, and I, I, I have mentioned it before, but we are members of the single euro payments area as well. And I think that shouldn't be underestimated as well, because we speak about currency on one hand, but then we also speak about the transaction costs and the time in terms of receiving and making payments. And we are members of that, that SEPA area. So in terms of a, a, an Irish company dealing with a customer in Milan, for an Irish company, it is no different to dealing with that customer in Mullingar. Uh, it, is, it is effectively a domestic market in terms of currency and payments and the speed at which you receive them. So it is really as good as it gets in trading in, in, in the Eurozone. That would be our, uh, almost my closing remarks in terms of this session is that, uh, you know, I know, I know uh, our, our Minister for Foreign Affairs, um, once it was said it during the Brexit process, he said, look, we live in the, the ultimate trading environment in terms of the Eurozone. Um, and when the UK leaves uh, the EU, it will not be as good. And that has absolutely transpired. The Eurozone and the single currency is the uh, utopia of trading environments. Uh, for Irish companies. And I think we should definitely be maximizing uh, the benefit of that. And we possibly haven't to this date been over reliant on the UK and the US to a small extent, but certainly the UK, we should be maximizing that advantage that we hold. Good, good. Very much the purpose of, of this session and these the series of sessions is to demystify the continental market as much as possible for those businesses here in Ireland who are thinking of expanding and going international. So um, that's a very well-made point, John. Uh, if none of the other panelists have anything more to add as concluding remarks, we will go to our final speaker of the day and indeed the series, uh, Michael O'Sullivan, who joins us from Paris. Michael O'Sullivan is, is an investor and thought leader. He advises fintech companies and is co-founder of We Invest, Women Empowered to Invest. He's on the board of the Jane Goodall Legacy Foundation. He is a member of the World Economic Forum's Council on the New Economy, a Forbes contributor, a speaker at the 2020 TED Talk Conference. He's 20 years experience in global financial markets, most recently as chief investment officer in the International Wealth Management Division of Credit Suisse, where he worked for 12 years. Uh, he was an independent member of Ireland's National Economic Social Council from 2011 to 2016. And he's the author of a number of books and has contributed to journals such as Foreign Affairs, The Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, in addition to being a regular guest on TV, uh, stations such as CNN, uh, BBC, CNBC, and Bloomberg. Mike, uh, you're very welcome and look forward to your thoughts this morning. Hey, Dan, good morning. Uh, yeah, so just, just to start, I'm, I'm based in, in Paris, uh, uh, involved in two small startups here, one in finance, the other kind of a very small uh, beer project, uh, which has taught me a lot about doing, doing business in France, um, also done business in Germany, and, and, and obviously worked in um, in Switzerland. Uh, I suppose my, my starting point in trying to help people make sense of, of the continental market is this uh, is submarines um, and the, the reneging on a submarine deal by uh, Australia to, to France and what that tells us about our own place in the world. Uh, and to Ireland, it's a bit like our cousins kind of beating up on our new best friend. Uh, and, and I say that because, you know, from France and Germany, many of them uh, associate Ireland with the English speaking world um, and, you know, for different linguistic cultural uh, barriers. So I think my, my first piece of advice would be on, um, on culture. Um, you know, if you look at the UK economy, there's a, a supply chains around the UK, be it in energy, uh, in food, in supermarkets are under massive uh, stress. You know, fizzy drink makers have got two days worth of carbon dioxide. You can't get English beer or cheddar in, in France, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a, a, a short-term uh, 
opportunity for Irish exporters into Europe to take the place of um, those from the UK. So that's a kind of a short term imperative. In, in the longer run, um, I, I think there's a couple of things that exporting businesses from Ireland can do uh, to start with culture. One is, is really invest in language. Um, as a nation, we're not great at speaking languages, including our, our own. Um, so, you know, if, if you are a company looking to say the French or German market, take some of your younger employees and actually station them there and get them into the culture, get them speaking the, um, the language, and then they act as a sort of a, a pivot into that country. Uh, I think the other thing as well is have a story to tell that will differentiate you, Irish business, et cetera, from uh, the, the rest of the English speaking uh, world and, and, and try and make that as kind of unique and impressive as possible and focus on things like um, like, like innovation. Um, that, then the other element, I think, is just to go back to the EU. I mean, I think there is a, at the very top level in Europe, there is this talk about European values, etc. Uh, and that will take time to, to become tangible. But uh, there are some very, very um, concrete policy initiatives going on across Europe that economies in France and Germany and Italy are, are really beginning to take up. So it's green energy, um, it's getting women more involved in the economy, etc. Uh, and I think Irish companies need to be very aware of these kind of threads and strains and on one hand, you know, craft their, their own narratives according to those and also use them as sources of, uh, of funding and, and momentum for, for businesses. Um, that, then there's all the, the specifics of trying to interrogate um, local markets. Um, and, and I think, you know, Europe is strange in that um, the individual markets are quite different in how they, they operate. So in France, uh, there's a very, very strong network effect, um, whereas within an industries, companies, their owners, etc., cetera, are bound together in tight networks, you know, depending on school, region, et cetera. And if you want to break into supply chains, you have to break into those networks and, and identify how those networks uh, uh, work. Um, I, I think as, as relationships develop, Irish companies can also look at things like, uh, like acquisitions, uh, quite a good way to, uh, to, to grow. Um, and, and also I think um, innovation and in the post COVID economy uh, is something that's, I mean, if you look at France, the whole venture capital private equity industry is is absolutely thriving. There's a sort of startup uh, mania here. Lots of investment, things like programming the digital economy. Um, and there's even things that I guess that Irish companies exporting into these countries can 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 pick up um, uh, and, and learn as well. Um, so so I, I, I would sort of invest be, before I think um, before embarking on a big sort of export initiative, uh, invest in understanding the industry, how it works from a human social point of view, um, and, and, and also the various kind of ownership uh, structures. Our, Ireland is actually is, is quite, a, I find, an easy and transparent place to do business. Uh, and for some of the questions I have about businesses here, I'll email someone in Ireland, I'll get a, I'll get a, a reply straight away. We email someone in France, you, you won't get a reply until you actually go and physically see them and they, they trust you. You know, France is a, is a low trust society. Ireland's a very high trust uh, society. So just be aware of all of these cultural issues uh, because despite the, uh, the common market, they, they're still there. But the point I would make is that once you get into them, um, then you're in kind of for, uh, for, for, for good. Um, and, and maybe the last thing I would say, just in, in my experience, I mean, there is uh, a strong appetite in certainly in France, maybe Switzerland as well, two countries I know, for goods and services that are at the very, very higher end, be it in food or, or financial services. Um, and Ireland is, is a leader in some of those areas and people shouldn't be afraid to, 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 to push that. Great. Um... Thanks for that, Mike. Just want to pick up you, your last book was uh, quite downbeat on, on globalization and that we were entering a period of, of de-globalization. A lot has happened since the book came out, clearly the pandemic being, being the, the sort of world-changing event, uh, talk of strategic autonomy in Europe, that sort of thing. 
what's your sense within Europe uh, um, about how integrated things are in Europe? Do you think there has been no major implications from the pandemic? Do you think it's still as easy to do business across Europe as it was? Um, how do you see the pandemic having effect, having effect yeah. Uh, yeah. doing business in Europe? I mean, I think it is, um, I mean, what, what, one thing I would love to see is that there's, for example, a common European template for setting up a business because it, it, it can take in one country like 10 days, another two days. Um, I, I think it's getting a lot better. Um, I think the, so if you look at retail um, trade, the digital, digital economy before the pandemic was 5% of, of retail activity, now it's 31%. So there's been a, been a huge change there. Um, I, I do think this whole uh, idea of deglobalization and globalization giving way to kind of regionalization um, is, is very much in train and it's happening in Europe. So, where, you know, where I live in Paris, you can really sense that this is the center of political energy on Europe. But, you know, all the ideas, the initiatives are, are, are being driven out. So we, we, we post Brexit, we are firmly in Europe, um, I suppose my po point is that culturally we're, we're still kind of in the English speaking world, but the, the next five, 10 years in Europe, you have more of this strategic autonomy, you know, in battery technology, um, in AI, uh, other, other aspects of, of um, uh, uh, you know, data as well. Uh, and this is this is the big mega trend that Irish companies, I think, if they want to thrive, will have to jump on. And and I think for many Irish companies, the you know the marginal penetration they can make in maybe the US, and the UK is quite low, but the marginal market penetration and presence they can have um, in some European markets uh, can be very very high. Um, so things like you know doing R and D partnerships either between companies or universities, research centres is is really important. Um, I think also better understanding how EU level and, and, and local level government and, and financial support work uh, are also very important. I mean, in, in France, there's the, the BPI, which is a government investment bank, uh, which is probably the, the most complete public investment bank in, in Europe and gives a lot of support. So that there's, 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 you can really sitting here. You can really sense that Europe is moving towards um, a sort of a more. It's slowly moving towards a more kind of coherent uh, pan-European economy, with very specific kind of trends. As I said, in green energy, batteries, all that kind of stuff. A point I, I made constantly in the run-up to the Brexit referendum is that imports imports matter more than exports. Now I know. Enterprise Ireland is very much focused on the export side of things, but as an economist, uh, my big concern around uh, Brexit was that if there were if there were really serious disruptions with a No Deal, because Ireland imported so much stuff across a whole range of from food products to to nuts and bolts, that there could be ser serious disruption in 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 Ireland because everyone consumes, not everyone exports. Um, one of the things that's that's been surprising over the years has been that Irish companies continued to source from the UK yeah. even after the launch of the euro. Now, as you you're, you you know you mentioned this increased regionalization, do you see Irish companies looking at the eurozone, particularly post Brexit, as a source of importing the nuts and bolts, the ingredients for their food products? Um, you know those those things they need for their own businesses do you see a shift happening towards the european market as, as an import source I, I see it happening slowly dan i mean i think if i look for example at you know you take kerry or glanbia um or even crh you know t top level irish companies they all have a presence in nearly every state or many of the states in the us um they're penetrated into into latin america but but maybe much less so um into into europe um and, and there's, there's no reason i mean the, if, if you look at the diversity of food uh, across europe just to, to to focus on that example there's no reason why they shouldn't be um shouldn't be doing that and, and also potentially across uh, eastern europe as well um and just just as a, as a sort of a final point i mean one in in france in business it is very much uh, focused on these kind of networks where once you get into this kind of network or conglomerate of companies and suppliers, it tends to be a two-way street. So Irish companies exporting 
may also at the same time uh, import certain component parts of their supply chain from that same network. Great, good. Well, look, thank you to all of our speakers uh, this morning. We're coming to the end of uh, of both this event and the, and the series of events we, we've been running. Um, I'd like to hand over uh, to Anne Lanigan of Enterprise Ireland to, to bring matters to uh, a conclusion. Uh, this idea for the series of event was Anne's. It was uh, her idea to try and demystify the continental market as much as possible for, for Irish companies. And I hope we've done that. I feel, feel that we have. Um, but I think it'd be very appropriate for Anne to, uh, to close out the, uh, this series of events uh, that we've uh, had the pleasure of working with her on. Anne, over to you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to all our speakers today, to, to Michael, to Tobias, to Bika, to Greg, to John, and of course to our own uh, CEO, uh, Leo Clancy. Um, and a, a very big thank you to the IIEA, you yourself, Dan, and Michael Collins and all the team for collaborating with Enterprise Ireland on these three events, not just the event today. Um, but most of all, thank you to the audience, Irish Business, for showing your interest in European markets and attending our event today and indeed the other two events. I really hope that you leave today with a clearer picture in terms of the opportunities for Irish business in what is the biggest free trade um, agreement in the world, the EU, but also to understand the opportunities in the Eurozone, so those 19 countries who have adopted um, the Euro. And, you know, as Leo talked about, the opportunities in the changing landscape in Europe, so around supply chain disruption, digitalization, the green economy, and the recovery funds, the very large recovery funds that are being put in place right across Europe. We all know that disruption creates opportunity. And this is where the Irish are actually really good. So we do need to seize the day um, and really take advantage of the opportunities that are sitting right here on our doorstep. Um, we've heard about the challenges and I hope that you found it useful to listen to the participants today um, to hear how they have addressed the challenges and the tips that they have provided in terms of how you might go about um, really reaping the benefits of these markets. Um, we simply can't ignore this untapped opportunity. So I am the Eurozone uh, Regional Director for Enterprise Ireland. I'm based in Amsterdam and we have eight offices across the Eurozone and our market advisors in those offices stand ready to support Irish companies who want to export into Europe, whether that's starting out or actually scaling the business that you already have in Europe. But we do ask that you come prepared. You really need a market entry plan if you're going to enter into to markets before you land in front of a potential buyer. And we do in Enterprise Ireland have training and supports to help you through that process as well. So I would suggest if you are a client of Enterprise Ireland that you talk to your development advisor about those supports. If you're not a client of Enterprise Ireland, but you do have ambition to export, we'd love to hear from you. So please do contact Enterprise Ireland. And again, we can provide supports to bring you to a stage where you're ready to export. Um, and our door is always open. My door is always open. Very happy to support you where we can. So I guess I'll leave it at that. And once again, thank everybody for their participation today. And I really look forward to seeing you all in the Eurozone. Great. Many thanks, Anne. As I say, it's been a pleasure uh, doing this series with you. It's been very informative. And, and as I said, very much hope that we, we helped demystify uh, in some way uh, accessing the European market for those participants that have joined us over the three events uh, who are thinking of, of either getting into European markets for the first time or expanding. Uh, there's still a lot of issues to be discussed, you, the opportunities of the green agenda, supply chain problems that are currently going on. Uh, so I suspect we may uh, come back to uh, this issue next year uh, and, and delve back into the opportunities again. But let, let me thank my own colleagues and particular Daryl Lawler, who's done so much work on this. Uh, thank you, Anne and Enterprise Ireland and Leo, and thank all the panelists today and from the previous three uh, two, two events. Um, it's been uh, great to get your time. It's been very generous of you to share your thoughts with us. Um, and as we approach 9.30, right on time, uh, thank you, particularly the audience, and hopefully you've got, uh, you got a lot out of it. So thanks everyone for uh, assisting on this and sharing your thoughts and sharing your time. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.